Hello everybody. I'm not sure whether it's by design or by accident, but nearly all of the cars I've ever owned have come from the late 90s or the 2000s. I expect in the early days of my motoring journey, this is probably a practical concern, that was all that I really could afford, then recently new cars that had depreciated a little bit, which had everything I needed. However, as time has moved on and the early 2000s has become even further away than I think any of us want to admit, I find myself still almost exclusively looking at and buying cars from that kind of period. Every now and again I'll dabble with something a little bit later, but every time I go back into the classifieds I start looking at things at least 10 years old. So why is that? Is it the case, maybe, that we actually did things back then a little bit better? Well today's car I think is potential proof of just that. Nowadays the obsession, or the trend, whatever you want to call it, is with SUVs, and my opinions on those are fairly well known. I think they're largely bought by people that really do not need them. However, wind the clock back 20 years, and the then new thing to go for was the MPV. This was a quickly growing segment, really born out I suppose of the, the Renault Espace and its kin. These were cars that were bigger than your regular hatch. These were cars for slightly larger families, larger that is in quantity rather than simply size. So you have things like this Vauxhall Zafira, and to this day I still remember the many adverts featuring Griff Rhys Jones, which is particularly impressive because back then I didn't even know what a Griff Rhys Jones was. Quality of roads, however, I am not convinced has actually improved that much. This one is atrocious, thanks mostly to people like this chap here. Yeah, you keep smiling and messing up the road. You eye out my cameras. Oh, look. He's left some goodies. Now, if this were a dog owner, you'd be told to clear this mess up. But if you're a farmer, it's perfectly okay. You, look, look at this. Oh, my word. This is atrocious. This is a road covered in doo-doo. Anyway. Today's car is a 2004 Vauxhall Zafira GSI. We'll get onto the GSI a bit in just a moment. And it's been brought to me by its owner, Paul, who is a fascinating individual. He has, in fact, owned this car since it was almost new in 2004. It had 6,000 miles on the clock when he picked it up, and it now has, are you ready for this? 221,774. 75 amazing and believe it or not in that time it didn't really have that much work done to it until about a year or two ago at 193,000 miles he decided it might be time finally to put a clutch in it and maybe to replace the turbo apparently these are not normally expected to last anywhere near this long particularly in the GSI yet his had made it just fine and it's not like he's a man who doesn't enjoy the car oh no that chap putting his foot down in all the drive-bys that's not me that's Paul he loves this thing He purchased it originally because he wanted something that was both practical and fun. These days, of course, you are very well served by the hot SUV community, but back then, the choice if you wanted something with space and power wasn't so great. And remember, this GSI was the hot version of its time, but by today's standards, you'd barely call it lukewarm. Power is provided by a two-litre version Power is provided by a 2-litre General Motors Ecotec unit, the exact same one you'll find in the boot of a Vauxhall VX220 Turbo. It originally put out just shy of 200 horsepower, but now it puts out closer to 250. During its refresh, it got the turbo from the later Zafira VXR. It got a remap. It also got some KW V1 coilovers tuned by TDI. Most of the work on this car was done by Courtney. A few other bits were refreshed, a new downpipe was installed, a couple of cosmetic things were sorted, and the car has continued being used ever since. Apparently it was a few years ago that the idea came up of maybe selling the car and then he was told by his family that that simply could not happen. This was 
a member of the family. He has an M2 comp for having fun in, but I think in truth he probably has nearly as much in this. The M2 is faster, but faster doesn't always mean more fun, does it? I think we can all agree on that. So what is the Zafira then? Well, it's Vauxhall's people carrier, a small one as well. It's not really a huge car, but it is a genuine seven-seater, and that was important to him because he has several very insistent aunties who always wanted to come out on family gatherings, and he would have to play taxi for them. But he also didn't want to be that person holding everyone up when they went away on holiday. So how quick is it? Well, let me put my foot down and give you a taste. It's really got some pull in it actually. Turbo does take a little while to spool up and he tells me that's a recent development. Since the map that it had, it hasn't been quite as responsive as it was. So this should be considered perhaps still a work in progress. Gear shift is not great. Very similar perhaps to some of the old Lotus units that I've used. Very vague, very indistinct, not particularly precise and also really long way down. I mean, you sort of have to sort of rummage around down here to find it. Maybe I've gotten a little bit used to my S2000 where you sort of move your hand an inch and the gear lever is right there. It's sort of petrol head perfection, that car. This one is more hilarity personified. I love the idea of a hot, sensible car. I mean, Britain has always had an obsession with the hot hatch and the hot MPV is just an extension of that. This was, at the time of its production, the fastest MPV on sale, or at least on sale in the UK. That being said, it had a 0 to 60 of over 8 seconds and a top speed of just under 140, so it wasn't exactly lightning fast, but still brisk enough. And indeed, even today, once the turbo does decide to get spinning, it's actually got a pretty healthy amount of pull in it. Visibility is excellent. You can see pretty much all round loads of glass in this thing. Your driving position is, of course, reasonably high. And this car is closely related to the Vauxhall Astra of the time, which means that this is really quite a nostalgia trip for me. I have some serious, serious love for the old Astra for very personal reasons. And you've got the familiar sort of little orange dot matrix, it feels like, screen here. You've got indicator stalks, which are quite familiar to anyone that's driven driven an old Vauxhall or a brand new Lotus. And of course, you've got this mixture of cheap and nasty scratchy plastic, the odd bit of vinyl, the odd bit of imitation leather, and potentially some real leather. They do say these seats are half leather. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Not the fanciest leather, if they are. Paul is an engineer by trade, so takes great pride in how his car is set up, the way that it works, and he was very happy with the work that TDI did on the suspension. So it's the V1, which means it's not adjustable, and that suited him just fine, because he, like me, doesn't really believe that much in adjustable suspension. Unless you are an expert in such a thing, I think adjustable suspension is just many ways of getting something wrong. Power, as you might have guessed, goes through the front wheels. Fairly confident there's not a limited slip diff in sight, because the car does scrabble just a little bit as you get the power down. Now, as you pick up the pace, it does develop a little bit of compliance, but I am told this car is set up to be optimum in terms of handling, comfort, and all that jazz, with four people in it. I have just had some breakfast, so maybe I can count for two, but four, I think, even for me, will be pushing it. It certainly doesn't embarrass itself down this kind of road. And although the chassis may not really be excellent, I'm actually getting a surprising amount of feedback through the steering wheel. I think it's very easy to forget just how exciting normal cars used to be to drive. You do need some fairly deliberate inputs to get it to do what you tell it. But I'm really enjoying this sort of interaction, just the sort of constant feeling of the wheels just moving around a touch. Gearbox is a five-speeder, by the way. I just went for six and then remembered I wasn't going to find it. Space in here is actually really good too, although not excellent. However, you've got to remember, this is a genuine seven-seater with room in the middle seats anyway for full-size adults. I can sit in there just about. I'm 5'10". There's just a little bit of clearance. But this is a car with the same footprint, or actually slightly less, than a BMW M140i. That's amazing.
I'm very thankful that downpipe aside, the exhaust is pretty much standard. It would be very easy to go overboard with something like this, but I think it would then completely lose its cue car status. And this does have very much a, a cue car feel about it. I do believe that the original marketing campaign involved an advert with Boney M's Daddy Cool playing. The idea being to try and persuade people that this was the sensible car that wouldn't have fun made of it because it was quick, it was cool. How's turning circle? Turning circle? Actually not that bad. So let's give it some beans. So yeah, turbo light. Come about 6,000 RPM it's then sort of done yeah between five and six is where you feel like you want to change it's geared sensibly so you can work through at least the first three ratios without doing silly speeds it means it's also got reasonable pull i forgot to inquire about fuel economy i found the fuel economy it says 31.8 miles to the gallon that's that's about what i'd expect yeah an overall average for the last sort of 100 miles or so 31.9 that's okay for an older performance orientated vehicle which has then been upgraded just a little bit actually it does okay the ride is not what i'd call cosseting you have a sunroof up here i'm getting a fair bit of wind noise in the car but it's actually not that windy a day road noise not too bad this car has been all over the place i mean how else would you require 220 plus thousand miles in it as far as he's concerned he puts down this car's longevity to simple mechanical sympathy it gets its oil changed every six months regardless of the mileage done and he makes sure to both warm up and cool down the turbo properly before turning the car off and i love that it's been kept in good but not pristine condition there are plenty of stone chips and things on the front there are a few little imperfections in the bodywork as there should be this car should be proud of its mileage it apparently is nearly unheard of for one of these engines to reach this kind of mileage and still be in fine fettle it's burning only the smallest amount of oil in fact when we were doing the drive-bys i just got this lovely sort of warm or hot oil smell remind me a little bit of going to the old steam fairs as a kid does that kind of smell real nostalgia trip this car oh yeah spun up a wheel there funny i spun the wheel up and then after i'd kind of caught it then the traction control light flashed up as if to say by the way you were spinning there just hope you knew that yes Thank you car, I know. The steering wheel incidentally is new, the old one got a little bit tatty, it feels pretty nice in the hand, fairly thin rim so you get plenty of texture through it. Nothing in here really feels particularly high end, but if you do then remember it's essentially based on a 1990s Vauxhall, it, it is what you'd expect from a cheapish British car of the time. Nowadays you can pick one of these up for, well, couple of grand really if you can find one because they didn't really make very many less than 3,000 were ever built allegedly fewer than half remain although there are rarely very accurate ways of finding such a thing out that is however a figure I could believe because I'm pretty sure a lot of these were crashed blown up wrecked stolen whatever like this was for the time I suppose still fairly brisk and probably had equivalent power I guess to the Golf GTI and to put that in something like this and probably did cause a bit of a stir. I don't really remember. A lot of the time with these reviews I get told off because I, I fail to remember what a car was like 20 years before I was born. In this one I'm just going to use the excuse that when I was 13 or 14 when this car came out I just didn't really care about people carriers. They were, they were all boring. Now though I think there's something distinctly cool about them. It is absolutely tragic that they've kind of fallen by the wayside. We've just sort of forgotten about them. They've been consigned to the history bin because they're great. I love estate cars, but estate cars just aren't good enough for a lot of people. And Paul was considering getting a sort of Volvo seven-seater with the little rear-facing seats in the back. But then when he found out that this existed, he said, no, that's, that's the car for me. Oh yeah, that turbo comes on quite late, about two and a half thousand, three thousand or so. And quite suddenly, it's not a smooth transition. The car is on Michelin Pilot Sport 4s. You can't get 4S in these tyre sizes, and they are an excellent tyre, and they do a very good job of gripping nicely. I can tell that if conditions weren't perfect, this would be a car where it'd be very easy to get it wrong. If it was wet underfoot, and you imagine what tyres were like 15 years ago, 
I can see why there are less than half of these remaining. <laughs> oh, it's good fun though. It's classic black on white dials. They do look and feel kind of a bit sportier than the usual sort of Astra stuff I'd expect. And that might have been a GSI touch. I don't know. Someone tell me. This Arden blue paint, I do know that. So there was, I think, a sport line trim or something of that equivalent where you could make your regular Zafira look like one of these, but you could only get the GSI in Arden blue. There wasn't a VXR of the first generation, but there was a VXR of the second generation, which is where it's got its turbo from. And I'd be interested to see how that car differed from this. Obviously, it's going to be quite different being based on a wholly different car. If you could find one of these for a few thousand pounds in good condition, this is legitimately quite a lot of fun. For not a lot of money, it's got a lot of space in it. The one thing in the interior that does look really quite out of place is these Recaro seats, because they look like they've been stolen from a sort of 1980s Ford or something, with a sort of weird, not quite confetti, but, you know, very 1990s fabric in the middle of them, and this allegedly half leather outer. They, they look very, very period, but not this period. That's the weird thing. They do look older than the rest of the car, but they're nice. They support you well enough. You've got some basic adjustment in them. So you, yes, actually, lean back a bit more. That's a, that's a bit more comfortable. So you can get yourself comfy in them. You should be able to find yourself a decent driving position. I thought they'd go lower than this, but alas, they do not. <laughs> oh dear, spinning the wheels in an old Vauxhall Zafira. That's not how I thought my day was gonna go. Anyway, what do you all think? Is this still daddy cool or is it just, dad, you're embarrassing me, please go home? Let me know in the comments down below. Thanks ever so much to Paul for bringing it out. It's been a riot. Please like, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.